Hey friends, thanks for taking time to listen in on a conversation Dick and I had with American F2 driver, Jack Crawford. Have you ever wondered if you should go all in on your dreams in life? Or wondered about the road to F1 for American racing drivers? The relentless determination of 19-year-old up-and-coming racer, Jack Crawford, to reach his dream of being on the F1 grid is nothing short of inspiring. As you'll hear, he is an excellent mix of self-control, talent, and single-mindedness. We hope you walk away excited to see his future attain even more heights. But before we get to the conversation, I need to take a moment to ask, have you subscribed to or followed the show on your favorite podcast app? Have you shared the show with your fellow F1 fans? If not, can you take a moment to do so now? For an indie podcast like us, that's how we grow. And to those of you who have already done so, the guys and I thank you. Hope you enjoy our conversation. Dick, I am probably the most excited so far that we have been doing this podcast. The person that we're getting to interview today is someone we've both discussed, actually, I think, in one of our very first episodes. He probably doesn't realize it, but we gave him a shout out because <laughs> we were so proud of him as a Texan. And both of you and I have connections to Houston, and yep. John is a Texan as well. We were really excited to see his trajectory, and that was a year ago. And we wouldn't have had any clue that we were going to get to have this conversation we're about to have. So I want, I know in all the other interviews, I've been the one introducing or starting the conversation. Dick, as our racer on the call, John couldn't join us today, but you're going to ask his questions. Dick, you want to start off our conversation with Jack? Yeah, absolutely. So Jack, first of all, thanks so much for joining us. We're, you know, as Sabrina said, we're mega excited to have you join us um, as a, as a former human. Houstonian. Um, I think it's just even better. Not only are you a Texan, but a, a Houstonian as well from the Woodlands. Um, <laughs> racing in Europe in Formula Two, um, doing a lot of the stuff that that I dreamed about when you know I was a, a teenager. Um, you're actually doing it, man, and so I'm absolutely thrilled about that um, for you. And um, man, we're you know we're super hopeful for you uh, going forward. And um, being is that that I started off in karting, and I know you you karted. Just really curious, you know, just starting off where it all began. Um, It sounds like your dad um, was involved with the construction of the Speed Sports Park there in New Caney, Texas, which is really a suburb uh, on the north side of Houston. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, so my my dad, he he owns uh, Speed Sports. um, And um, so he's not not really involved on the the track side, but he does own own it. And um, it was his idea, of course. And I mean, the idea about behind it was he wanted to build me a go-kart track and at, the, at, at that point I was around probably 11 12 years old so it was a good time and then all of a sudden I just sort of sort of grew out of go-kart so I actually never I've, I don't think I've only ever done one one club race there um, oh wow although I've done a lot of, a lot a lot of laps probably you know as much as anybody else um, I've been doing doing laps around there for years in uh, all kinds of carts um, more recently in shifter carts in the past couple years Um mm-hmm. So that's uh, and it's five minutes away from my house. So that's uh, amazing. Cool that's amazing. So um, for your shifter card, are you, I'm assuming you're on a Burrell then. Yeah, I was. I was running a Burrell um, the years I did it in 2022 or 21 and 22, um, and then I I did my very last go kart race at the end of 2022, um, and I did it on the on a Formula K chassis. Nice. Okay. Awesome. Um, so how did you get tied in then with Alan Rudolph? So I actually don't know though full story but my dad um my dad hired him um to to run the go-kart track and okay. um you know we i think we met him out in uh in phoenix where where he's mm-hmm. from at one of the the challenge of america's races and um i think they they had a good relationship and um alan was the the right guy yeah yeah so for our listeners alan rudolph is a, a multi-time national champion um and he uh, runs the alan rudolph academy there at speed 
sports. Um, and, you know, pretty much if you just want to experience a cart, see what it's all about, you can go do that. Or, um, you know, they've got a full on program there that you can that you can get involved in. And, and certainly speed sports is, you know, one of about two or three of the absolute top tracks, not only in the country, uh, but really here in Texas, we're pretty fortunate to have some pretty amazing facilities. Um, do you do much sim racing on your own or, or do you just do exclusively simulator work for Aston or whatever the case may be? Yeah, I do. I do tons of simulator. I, I play iRacing um, a lot. So I have a little sim in my home in, in Moon Keynes. And um, if I got a little bit of free time, that, that's what I'm doing. So I, I'd say I'm a pretty hardcore sim racer. Um, it, it, it mainly started back in 2020 during during the shutdown, uh, during mm-hmm. the lockdown, um, when I think most people really got into it. Um, I was already into it a little bit, but especially then when, you know, I couldn't really go outside. It was just, you know, sim my room and sim, sim, sim. And um, at the end of the day, I think it, it helps me as well, um, you know, just for, for other simulators like the Aston Martin simulator, I'm able to, to show well every time I do that as well. Yeah. So I guess the sims, you know, not speaking as a guy that does a lot of sim racing myself, but from my conversations with you know guys like you and and some of my colleagues, the the feeling is is that it's a great way to at least learn which way an unfamiliar track goes and just kind of get an idea of what to expect um, before you get there. Is that is that kind of how how you see sim racing as well, or is there more to it? Yeah. So for for me, there's kind of there's kind of two sides to it. Um, you know, the the one side is the the home sim, which is you know lots of lots of fun. I I really enjoy it um just you know racing you know random cars against uh, random people on random tracks um that's that's the part i enjoy and as well you know it's fun just being competitive and and racing and, and battling and all that mm-hmm. and then you know there's also the the professional side for me which is um you know our preparation before events uh, for formula two and as well the professional side of helping Aston martin um on the simulator as well which is um you know more of a, a working environment um right which i, I I still enjoy 100%. Um, but yeah, you're right. For for the event prep preparations that we do, um, you know, it's all about learning the track, um, which you know we 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 know most of them by then by now. Um, mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's great to have that that tool. It's it's become a very uh, useful tool for for all teams. I can imagine. I can imagine. And in and so like when you're looking at, at developing new pieces or something like that, are they actually? Or I mean, the modeling must be absolutely amazing that you can jump into the car and say, yeah, we're going to a different front wing or a different rear wing. And you can actually feel the difference, I guess, in in those simulators that the teams have. Is that is that an accurate statement? Yeah, yeah, it is. Especially when you get you know higher up. Um, you know the the Formula One sims nowadays are just incredible how how accurate they are and how much they can test the setups and stuff. Um, it's it's really unbelievable. I think you know they they take the numbers from the real track and they can put it exactly into the computer and and put it onto you know a, a virtual you know track car so it's it's quite cool and and you're right it's uh you know we can test all kinds of aerodynamic parts and um stuff like that there's so much to to test you know mm-hmm. can i interrupt really quick i want to help our audience connect the dots you guys are the technical people the racers <laughs> um so not that person and i wondered when you just said like the data that's happening like in winter testing and summer and all the different breaks but how much of the data that happens during the actual track weekend between free practice one and two are you getting data and they're making the setups and changes are you helping them like is that pretty much quick turnaround and then them trying to figure out exactly what they need to do in time for free practice two and then three you know all throughout the weekend yeah so there's for me there's two kind of two different types of sim dates with uh, Aston Martin there's a normal sim day after let's say a race weekend or a random period where they just want to you know test a few things they might be bringing to the car new additions or things they saw from the last race that they want to test and then there's also um it's called a event support which is um you know you're there for the for the weekend um after every session until you know af- after fp3 is when you when you stop and you're basically um after the session the the engineers at track are, are giving you a bunch of uh, about a bunch of things that you want to test that they want to test and they want to see how how it does in the sim and you know the sim correlates pretty well to to real life so 
So, you know, you're doing doing that as well and helping helping the race team. Like I'm just thinking that we see the drivers and all the hard work that they're doing on track, but you're behind the scenes. I think in one of the things I was reading, it said shadowing them. We don't realize, I think, as the fans, all the hard work that's happening by those of you inside the sim. And so does that mean then in between the Grand Prix, like you're also still working on the sim and doing that work as well as trying to get back and forth wherever they're needing you and racing your own your own races like it's quite a bit of activity that you're having to do all year long in addition to your sim work is that correct assumption yeah it's a, it's a very busy year um at least from from my side the the focus is on f2 first and um you know Aston Martin are aware of that and they're completely comfortable with that as you know they also have um another sim driver that can help out so i'm not the only one and of course f2 is my focus so it's just about you know when i have free time time, um, you know, they'll ask me to to be in the sim and help out. So I, I, I help out whenever I can. Okay, Dick, I just had to ask those questions in there. No, it's all great questions because I was just kind of like, man, oh man, this Jack is busy. I mean, that's what I was thinking in the back of my mind because just running F2, forget the, the Aston Martin piece of it, just F2 alone and fitness and all those other things, It's that's a huge schedule. And so very interesting. So one of the things that, that I was thinking about and um, just curious to get your take on it. You know, watching F1 at Jeddah, um, when I watch that track as a racer, I'm sitting there thinking, oh man, you know, other than, you know, running on an oval, it just feels like that those walls are right there to just reach out and grab you. Um, it's got to be an amazing feeling to put together a lap around that place. What are you, you know, I know you're in an F2 car, but still it's got to be pretty amazing. What, what were your thoughts about it? Yeah, well, the, the street tracks are, are incredible. Um, you know, especially, especially Jetta. actually last year, um, Jetta is this, was the second round of the season and, uh, was my first year in F2 and that was my first street track. So it was, uh, yeah, your, your free practice, it's, uh, you definitely definitely take a bit of margin at first because it, it definitely <laughs> comes at you and you know you're always always surprised um how quick it is and how almost you know you're how scary it is you know your mm -hmm. arch in your mouth basically what they say and um it's uh you know at, at some point you just got to go out and uh, and forget about that fear and um especially when it comes to qualifying you can't you can't leave anything on the table um so right. all those all those street street tracks like jetta and monaco and and Baku, those are are ones that are you know they're they're special qualifying laps even if you're not on pole you know yeah talk to me a little bit about Baku because that track is really interesting you've got some you know you've got that long straightaway all the room in the world and then you get in that section there with the the old castle and it looks like you might be a car width wide through there what's that like that's got to be like driving through a funnel or something yeah Baku Baku is incredible because you know on on paper it's a, it's a street track you know but you you know, and my my thought going into it was that it doesn't really seem like a street track. There's lots of runoff um, during the braking zones, and um, you know, going into it, it didn't really feel like one. But then I got there, you realize that you know, if you if you lock a brake, you gotta commit at the at the corner entry, whether you're gonna go for the corner or not, or else you're going <laughs> into the wall on the outside. So yeah. uh, that that track definitely uh, you know surpassed my my expectation on on that side. And yeah, it's uh, it was an amazing track to qualify on and the races are crazy there um it's such a like you said it's such a tight twisty section as well it's basically a, a no passing zone because mm -hmm. no way you're you're passing through there and um the track it's very like you said long straight so everyone has cold tires going into turn one and there's been um <laughs> some huge huge wrecks going into into I, turn one over the years i can only imagine you get the tires exactly where you want them and then they cool off on you. <laughs> it's like nobody's home in turn yeah. one yeah that's got to be uh, exciting. What I, you, you know, Sabrina and I visited um, on another podcast with one of the Team USA drivers, his name is Jack Sullivan. And Jack was telling me, us that for him, Silverstone was really a challenge because he's used to hilly tracks like a mid-Ohio or uh, someplace like that. And he goes, you go to, to Silverstone, it's really, really flat and it's very difficult, or at least he says it was very difficult for him to pick out the corners and 
and have the car positioned correctly to, you know, um, carry the speed through the corner so that he's got a really fast exit for the next, you know, straightaway to follow. Did you experience something similar to that or given the, that it used to be an airport? Yeah, there's a uh, trucks and trucks in Europe are, are really interesting and they're, they're great. Um, you know, Silverstone's a, a special one. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, like you said, it's, it's on airport uh, run or it used to be an airport. So it's naturally a very windy place as they always play airports in, in windy positions. And mm-hmm. I'm thinking there's actually a, maybe, you know, there's a couple of tracks that are like that. Um, and, you know, the wind is, is something we got to, you know, put in our minds as well. And, you know, the wind's changing a lot. So, you know, that could, could play a factor as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, Silverstone's a very particular track. It's all high speed stuff and you just have to be so, so precise. And um, especially when you move into faster cars, it gets, you know, more and more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would think that like, yeah, I, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, the, the faster the car, obviously more aero. And so if you're headed into the wind, you're going to have a car that's going to be more on the nose. And if you've got the wind behind you, I guess you probably have a car that would tend to want to want to push a little bit. Um, I mean, is that a correct ex- assumption? I'm just now thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. We uh, actually going into, you know, every session we're always, it's one of the biggest things we look at is the wind. It can change lots of, you know, breaking points. It can change the way you need to drive the corner. It can change the balance of the car. So, you know, sometimes the, the team will, will change the setup, you know, if they see the wind is, is blowing a certain direction for certain corners you know stuff like that so you know they especially at such a high level they they think about all the factors you know that's really interesting and so for you personally when you jumped from f3 to f2 how big a jump was that i mean was it something pretty seamless or was it something where you're like holy smokes this is a whole lot more car yeah so actually the jump from f3 to f2 is not not ginormous um you know the biggest jump is actually from f4 to f3 um when you get a, a proper proper downforce um, for the first time in F3, pr- proper brakes, a proper engine. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, going to F- F2 is more of an evolution of everything. Um, you know, a much heavier, bigger car. Of course, it has more downforce. It's faster. Um, it also has a, a turbo engine as well. So, you know, there's def- there were definitely some things to learn. But, you know, generally, it, um, you know, you, you, you still have to adapt to it, of course. But generally, um, you know, if you have some F3 experience, you'll, you can adapt pretty well in a, in a day or two to the F2 car. For the engine and the given that it's a turbo and all that, do you do you have to deal with turbo lag or, or is the engine just so well dialed in these days that turbo lag is really not that big a deal anymore? Yeah, so um, that was the, the very first thing I noticed um, when I got oh. into the F2 car um, was the, the turbo lag. My, my very first lap is that I was like, oh man, I got a lot of lot of margin on the X. I could have been on throttle a lot earlier. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, now I'm, I'm, this is going into my my second year and um i'm so used to it now i don't know what it's like to drive a naturally <laughs> aspirated car anymore right so, right uh, yeah. you know you, you get used to it over time yeah yeah no understood understood um so when then would be your next race i mean obviously you're not racing in china this weekend um no so my my next race is in in imola and we so we have our away races which are bahrain Jeddah, and melbourne and then we go into our our european sort of tour which is basically we do all the European tracks on the F1 calendar. So Got it. Got all it. everyone, yep, yep. So you're going to be really getting busy here, roughly the first of May. I mean, yep. you already as are. As soon as, as, soon as May starts, it all it all kicks off to the end of July. I don't think there's maybe at most there's a, a one or two week break at most while while F1 goes to Canada. But um, that's about it, and um, it's going to get really busy, and it's going to go by really fast, and it's it's such a crucial part to to our season. Yeah, I can imagine. And during the off season, do you actually go back to Houston or do you stay over in Europe? Yeah, yeah, I go back to, to Houston every time I get you know a month or, or two off. Um, I, I go back home visit my family. I I always will spend Christmas and, and New Year's with my family. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, actually this year was the the shortest break I had, which was over over Christmas, um, which was about uh, a month. So I I got back um, a week before Christmas and I was I was gone a week after New Year's. So um, oh, wow. it was a uh, that felt like a long time to be honest. So uh, yeah, it's quite uh, 
that quite crazy how how busy you can get even though you know you, you think you're only doing 14 races um which is our our calendar length and it, it turns into so much more every time. yeah yeah i can only imagine yeah i would think even just being able to decompress a little bit and and take a breath and kind of allow yourself to slow down and relax. Um, I think that that might be a little bit of a challenge too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've uh, I've learned over the past year, I think, you know, the three schedule, it's relaxed, it has more breaks and you get an F2 and it's nonstop. And actually, I got sick a, a couple of times that, you know, I finally started to switch off um, last year and I got sick. So I've, I've learned my, my lesson um, <laughs> on that and to just pace myself more throughout the year. Yep. And um, especially since since now I'm, I'm doing more with Aston Martin as well. So I got sort of a, almost a double kind of program. So I'm, I'm more busy and, um, you know, I've really been, when I got time off, I'm really, really using it to my advantage. Good for you. Good for you. Serena, you've been really, really quiet. I feel like I've been dominating the, the conversation. How about you jump in? I know you've got all sorts of questions. Well, it's funny because I was like, oh, he's just loving this conversation. I am. And I was <laughs> listening and smiling here thinking I'm happy to let you ask to your heart's content. But that said, I do have a lot of questions as well, because first off, I think your age and your story, as I've learned more about it, has really impressed me how you entered into the world of motorsport and your family, their willingness to make decisions at such a young age for you to be able to pursue this dream, I thought I think is also very inspirational. And, and I believe, and you can correct me if if I'm wrong, um, it's kind of unique in how they've done the different things that they've done, in which I think that's part of the reason probably you're seeing such strength at such a young age. Um, and also where you have found yourself positioned, I think, is not something we're hearing a lot of American drivers getting to achieve what you're getting to achieve. So I think that this would be great for our audience to understand just how hard you've worked to get there and how hard you're continuing to work. I mean, when I'm listening to the things that you and Dick have been talking about. It really is about every minute counting and you're really packing it in to make sure you're positioned. And so those are all things that I, as a non-racer, I have been inspired by those of you who are racers as to how efficient and focused y'all are. So that's that's kind of my personal take before I start asking you kind of rapid fire questions because we want to be very mindful of your time. So first question, you mentioned your winter break was very short. It was that because of the testing that you were doing in Bahrain? Yeah, so the we have a new car in, in Formula 2 this year, so mm -hmm. we actually had the opportunity to do a, a sort of a shakedown day, which is unofficial, um, mm -hmm. but everyone everyone did it, and that was, I think that was a, probably the third week of January, if I'm, if I'm uh, correct, or the fourth week. Yeah, so we started preparations for that, um, I think, second or second or third week in January, and, you know, then we were we were off to Bahrain in early February, and then, you know, your season start, starts, starts to kick off so I was over over quite early and um, I'm, I'm glad I got to spend some time with my families. I wondered because we during the F1 calendar we tried to do rev race reviews and this year we did one on testing and so something that Dick noted during perspective of reviewing it was the gravel that was on the track and how it was affecting like the high degradation situation. I wondered what may not be obvious to us watching it on TV that's obvious to you as a racer on that track about why there is such a high deg. Is there anything that you could help us to see a little bit clearer? Yeah, so so basically, um, you know, and they call it in more uh, engineering terms, they call it micro rough roughness and macro roughness, which is basically um, they measure the distance between the stones um, uh -huh. and the, the abrasiveness of the stones and um, the space between the stones combined with the abra abrasiveness of the stones in the track um, create a lot of high deg and bar the highest of the year um, on both of those. So that always, whenever we go to Bahrain, we always know it's going to be a, a degradation race and it's going to be very, um, you know, very challenging on the tires always. Um, and then we go to a track like like Jeddah or Melbourne, which is the exact opposite, which is a street course and that doesn't have a lot of running. It hasn't been used much. Um, and so those are the the kind of little differences that, that, that everyone has. Do you think your work in the sim 
them helps you in even having greater knowledge of all these different types of differentials between the tracks because you're having to hear from the engineers the data that they're pulling. You're testing it out even though it's not real world. Do you feel that that's giving you a comparable, as much as it can, I guess, in a virtual way, practice uh, versus like maybe a decade ago or eras ago where drivers got to have just almost unlimited track time? Do you see where I'm kind of going to? Do you feel that you're still getting to be positioned to prepare as best as possible? Yeah, yeah, 100 percent. You know, and in, in Formula Two, we only get a, a 45 minute practice, and you know, like we were just talking about Bahrain. Bahrain's, you know, a specific one where in practice your tires are not gonna last more than more than three laps. So you know, you got to be on it straight away. And you know, we'll I you know I basically know all the tracks by now, but you know, it's always the same tracks are always around the same time of year. So you know, you'll come to the track in in February and you haven't raced it for a year. So that's why we do the simulator prep is to to one not only prepare the car and get a you know a, a little setup going, but also to for the driver to re-familiarize himself with the um, with the track and um, to to practice techniques so that when you arrive uh, for that you know short free practice session that you're on it straight away and you're performing um, at your best. That's really helpful because I think it's Amazing. been a conversation that we've been having about the difference of testing time that young drivers especially are getting, especially as you're waiting to be able to move into that F1 seat and then the short runway, it seems, up to be able to prove yourself that you, you know, as the contract negotiations and staying in that seat. And I've just been trying to wrap my brain around how is it is it fair to you all who are working so hard to get to that seat? Are you getting, are you being set up for success? Sounds like, especially in your case, because you're getting to do that sim work with Aston Martin, that you are getting that, that time to learn the track. Because what I, my perspective, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that Americans are at a disadvantage because you aren't growing up on those tracks like the Europeans are. You're you're coming in and having to do that, uh, unlike you, maybe some of the other drivers who are older that de- don't get to move over like you have, and they're having to do that at a much rapid pace. Do you see kind of where I'm trying to put the pieces together and see what yeah, the fair, yeah, what sure. the advantage it's, or disadvantages uh... it is to be an American trying to do what you're trying to do? Yeah, for sure. It's tough. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have come over when I was in F4 um, and, and learned some of the tracks and then in, in F early on in my F3 career as well. Um, but, you know, I always I always think that, you know, if an Indy car driver was to come over, it would it would be tough. There's, you know, if an Indy car driver was to race in, in Formula 1 without knowing any of the tracks, that's, you know, 24 new tracks to learn, which is a lot. And, um, you know, it, it, it'd be the same, you know, if, uh, you know, an F1 driver was to go race in America, he wouldn't know the tracks and that that is a, a an advantage especially in the in the lower ranks in f3 and f2 um and it's uh it, it definitely plays a big factor for sure yeah. and then i think because of some of the other conversations john dick and i have had amongst ourselves and some of the other interviews that we've done other side of it is just the financing aspect of you getting to where you are that's not an easy proposition and that kind of goes back to what i was saying about your family that i'm quite impressed by how dedicated they have been and even their decision to let you go to Europe. I wondered like what the transition was like for you, what the transition was like for them, because like you're making this decision. I think you were how old when you decided to move to Europe? It's a decision that I when I when I read that, I thought most kids make that decision at 18. But mm-hmm. you made that much earlier. And when kids generally do that, it's after they've graduated high school, they probably are going to take a study abroad or a gap year. But you made that before you even went to high school. And so I just wonder how has that been for for you as you're doing this intense schedule that you ha- you're doing now or even since that transition? Because you had to still keep up with your academics while you're trying to do your racecraft. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite a quite a long story. I mean, uh, you know, f- you know, the second uh, the second most important thing, of course, uh, after having having talent is having the the backing behind you. Um, I was lucky enough to have my my parents, um, you know, supporting me what I do, and you know, they they love it as well. Um, so I'm. I'm I'm glad they've they've been there helping me because um, that's definitely the the second most important thing is to you know an F3 and F2 the, the drivers don't get paid you have to to find your own money um, in in even through karting you know it's all all paid through um, through the parents you know so that's a uh, you know I have to give a huge props to my parents for 
up. And um, yeah, my transition to Europe was, yeah, quite early. Um, I think I got on a plane to the Netherlands um, to start my uh, F4 season, my first F4 season with, with the Red Bull Junior team in the Netherlands. Um, I was 14 years old, I believe. And that's uh, right when COVID hit at the beginning of 2020. And, um, you know, I've been here ever since. I uh, I moved okay, to... Okay, hold on just a second. You yeah. can't see my face, but you <laughs> said right as COVID hit, you're getting on a plane to another country at the age of 14. Is that what I just heard? Yeah, yeah. I moved there um, when I was Your 14. mom is like amazing. I yeah, mean, your dad know, is too. Uh... But like your parents, their courage and willingness <laughs> to say we're going to continue pursuing this. Like, and were you going by yourself or were they coming with you or did you have like a chaperone? Yeah, yeah. I was I was by myself. I was uh, I was moving in with the family. Um, they're a family from the from the team, so I was I was lucky enough to have them. Um, but of course, it was a very very tricky time. We obviously didn't know that I was going to be locked out from going to the U.S. for the whole year, um, or vice versa, them coming coming to Europe. So I actually didn't see my parents in probably to October for I was probably seven or eight months. Um, so that was a you know quite a new experience, and um, you know I was lucky enough to have good people around me. Um, um, and I was able to to mature a bit more at, at a young age. That's like the understatement of Absolutely. I've ever heard. I'm yeah. like, you know, nobody can hear see my face, but I'm like, my jaw is on the floor. I mean, Jack, it's we. I know we we really want to be respectful of your time, but I hope that we can have a follow up conversation. Obviously, it can't be in the next few months while you're trying to make your way up the ladder <laughs> of the Formula Series. But I really would love to hear more about what what that experience was like. I would love to have that opportunity to share that with our audience. I think Dick, you would agree with me and so would John because yeah, right. you, you're you unique in and of itself by what you're achieving, but then also in this in the moment in history when you're trying to do it and what all you are and have sacrificed, that's so inspirational. It's only, again, another reason why I personally am so enthusiastic about motorsport is that each one of you who are choosing to do what you're doing, it's so counter to my personality. I I'm a risk averse person. So I'm always trying to understand people like you who are willing to be risk tolerant. What's going on in your head and how are you actually, you know, getting into that car and going at the pace that you're going? That was what I was expecting. But then now for you to tell us all that you went through in these years during COVID, uh, I'm just trying to understand how do you calibrate your mind to take those kinds of risks? Do you think that's something inside of you or is that something you've developed or maybe is it both? Um, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a bit of both. Um, you know, I, I feel like I, you know, first of all, I, I, I trust my own my own talent. Um, and I, you know, I really believe that, you know, from from a, even a young age that I, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a, a racing driver. I want to race in, in F1 or um, I just wanted to be a racing driver in general, you know. Um, and, you know, I, at such a young age, I, you know, I think me, I'd already decided I'd, I'd, I'd kind of not not given up on school, but, um, you know, at some point, like, you said I had to stop stop going to school and do it online and you know my focus was um was racing and um you know at, at, at such a young age I just had to commit and now you know it's been my whole life and you know I, I think you know I have a, a good career in front of me and it's uh you know something you have to bring out onto the track as well and uh you definitely you can't you can't leave anything out there you know you want to you want to have no regrets every time you you come up the track you have a more analytical nature I feel like I read you saying that in an article so somewhere. Do you think that that is a help for you in your racing or do you think that that is a hindrance in your racing? Yeah, it's a it's a bit of both sometimes. Um, yeah, I, I love I love the just the data part of it. I love, you know, looking at everything. I, I you know I've watched almost probably every single F1 race, F2 race, F3 race ever. I've I've looked at every, you know, bit of data I can and I feel like, you know, I always ahead of time I'm always let's say I'm going in with a plan and I always, you know, know what I want to do um, and of course that that can hurt sometimes because you know of course that doesn't sound very adaptable but um, you know there are, are certain drivers which are other ways um, which are just you know go out and and let's say be be a bit more crazy not have as much thought about things um, but I think at the end you know it's uh, it turns into to hundreds of a, of a second on the track um, you know it can play play both ways for sure yeah. yeah like what you just said that if I said earlier that I am totally not a risk person and that's what I admire you guys. What you just said now about analytical and plan, all 
that, that's me. And it totally resonates with me. Dick's probably over there laughing right now going, yes, Sabrina, that is you. You got to have a bit of both. You got to have, <laughs> you gotta a, have a bit of both. Right. You like you got to kind of know uh, where you're going to go. Moment. I want to have a roadmap, but I'm willing to take a detour or stay a little longer. That's totally fine. You know, uh, but tell me we're just going to go in the car and not know what we're going to do. That doesn't make any sense to me. I'm like, time is important. I got to know where I'm going. But OK, mm-hmm. so that was my question. So the question that I wanted to ask is when you said you want to put it all out there, and this is John's question, is what is your plan B? Now, we don't believe you're ever going to need that plan B, but mm-hmm. because we believe you're going to make it to F1. But what is that plan B or even a different way to state it is what are your post racing plans? That could be at 50 and 60 years old at this point, you know, because we're finding our racers are staying there much longer than anybody ever expected. That's kind of a wide open question for you. Yeah. So I guess I, I, I've i talked about it with my dad and, and my manager and, you know, we don't really have a plan B at the moment. I think um, especially on, on my side, there's there isn't really a plan B. I think, you know, motorsport is such a, you know, anything can happen kind of sport and, you know, expect the unexpected basically. Um, so, you know, there's so many, so many different opportunities that arise at, at any time. And um, of course, you're going to take the, the best opportunity for yourself. And if it's F1, then then that's amazing. Then that's my my dream, you know. And um, if it's something else, like another career in IndyCar or a sports car career or something like that, I'd, I'd also be happy. So I'm, I'm just going to, you know, play by ear basically on, on that part, part of it. Um, and, you know, af- after racing, it's uh, I haven't really thought about it yet. And, um, you know, I, I, I think racing has been my whole life so far, um, ever since I was, you know, four years old. So um, I've been doing it for 14 years, which, I mean, doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, it's been, I, you know, I, li- I live and breathe in. And from my side, it's, you know, it's it's something I want to do forever, of course. And of course, I can't be a driver forever, but, um, you know, I'd love to to still be involved in a team, um, whether it's owning a team or being a team manager. I think that would be just be great, honestly. Due to this, you know, it's funny because you starting at four and then going to Europe at 14, when you went to Europe, I mean, you you had 10 seasons under your belt already, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's incredible. The only other guy that I know of that could actually say that, I'm sure there's plenty, but Colton Herta, same deal, you know, and and he went, you know, a few years before you, obviously, but he went to, to, to the UK to run F4 when he was 14 years old, and he had been karting since he was four or five, you know, so... Again, you know, I mean, you know, talk about being a seasoned veteran at 14. I mean, that's just crazy. That's when I started karting. I was 14. So I'm like, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I always um, I always think about it like everyone, you know, especially in a, in a like, a, you know, everyone, everyone always says I'm, I'm so young for, for an F2 driver, which I am. Um, but, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't really feel that way in a way um, yeah. because I've been I've been doing it for, for such a long time and you know, I've been racing against you know some some of the same guys even though you know some are older than me um you know i've been racing against the pretty much the same group of f2 guys um since you know some of them from from go-karts from when i was really young and some from from f3 that are you know just started a bit later than me so yeah you know, but uh you know at the end it, it feels like we all have the same kind of experience you know mm-hmm. piggybacking off of that and tying a couple of pieces of things that you had said earlier you know mentioning you know the trans between an IndyCar driver kind of trying to come to the Formula One grid or vice versa, and then the choices that you've made to go to Europe and develop your craft there. Do you feel that there is a comprehensive pipeline within America getting drivers onto the F1 grid? Yeah, I think it's it's tricky because um, not I don't I don't I don't I wouldn't say a lot of F1 teams necessarily look at IndyCar for for drivers. Um, you know, IndyCar is a you know professional series in itself. Um, and obviously it's over in America and, um, you know, I, I, from, from my point of view, which is why I, I started racing Europe is that, you know, you have to be in, in Europe, you have to go through almost the sort of ladder system through F4, through F3, um, in F2, you, you just gain so much experience and there's so many, so many different things, um, compared to any car, you know, the, you know, the tires are, are a huge thing. We run on the pro tires, even in, you know, F4, F3, um, in F2 as well which are a huge difference like like you said as well the tracks you know the teams are are a bit different it's just a different um sort of environment and um you know it's it's uh i think it's hard for for f1 teams to look at indycar as an option um 
um, I think, you know, they might think it's too big of a risk. Mm -hmm. What about broader, like looking at Americans, even in the feeder series? I mean, because you got signed to the Red Bull Academy. That was, I mean, Helmut Marko is leading that. And they came to America and found you. Is that, do you think that there is that kind of effort to come into our younger racers and start developing them towards Formula One? Or is it more segmented, like, like American drivers or Carters and feeder series, they're all going to more the Indy NASCAR world? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite interesting because, you know, there aren't there aren't many Americans. Um, you know, there's there's me who um, was was lucky enough um, to have that opportunity. And, um, you know, someone like Logan as well, who was racing in Europe at a younger age. And I was as well in a bit in, in go karting. And, you know, there's a, a few American drivers, but they, you know, it all it all leads back to to racing in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's just really tough to to make a name for yourself for the, you know, the F1 teams over in over in the U.S. And, um, you know, I think people that are, you know, in the in the road to Indy or in a, in a feeder series like that, I think, you know, their their um, their path is is in the car. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, agreed. Which makes me even more inspired by what you're where you've already achieved at such a young age, your uniqueness and your determination, yeah. your relentless pursuit of your goal and the support of those around you to help you achieve that I think is very inspirational I keep using that word but that's the only word I can think of <laughs> yeah, so I really yeah. thank you <laughs> for that easy. you're going to be one of our future stars that we can say is on the as an American on the grid and we believe and I know I can speak for John and Dick we we believe that there should be more and the opportunities should be greater for those of you to make it easier for you who have talent to go and do what you're doing but we're yeah, just really yeah, glad I mean, you're breaking that path you know for them to make it yeah. a little bit more available yeah I, I agree I was actually talking to my dad about this on the phone the other day it's like you know it's it's the you know the biggest problem is how, how far away it is and that's you know the only the only problem it's like at such a young age you have to really commit and you have to have your family behind you and you know I was I was lucky enough to have that and um you know in, in racing in in Europe at such a young age that's where that's how it has to be done and you, you know it, you, you know the the only problem is that it's far away like I said um, yeah do you find that it's hard like is there a level of loneliness that comes because your family's on one side and you're over there and like do you have a support network that you can rely upon while you're while you've been doing all this that is in Europe with you yeah so I at, at, at the moment and, and for the past sorry, ever since 2021 I've sort of been on on my own a bit um, I moved into apartment and in 2022 so i've been living alone for 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 two years now i i'd say i'm, I'm lucky that my parents get to i get to have at least one parent at every race um still which is great um you know they're willing to to do the travel especially my dad um who travels to the majority of the races over the years and um yeah i also have yeah i'm actually so busy it's hard to hard to for you know it's hard to get homesick and stuff like that um but you know i'm i'm, I'm very fortunate as well to have, have great friends and a, a great support team you know, I have a physio, um, you know, a driver coach and a mental coach that are all as well helping me and they're all, you know, friends as well. Okay, Dick, you said earlier you felt like you were taking over. I realized that I kind of did the same, but it was because <laughs> I'm just in awe of Jack yeah. and what he's doing and what he's committing himself to. I know I have more questions, Dick. I have a feeling you have a lot more questions and I said it earlier. Hopefully after your races are done, maybe sometime later in the year, you'd be willing to let us unpack some more because we're just really proud of you jack and we really want to see you succeed and now in know knowing more about your story we're really even more inspired by you and hope that our little part of this indie podcast can be cheerleaders for you over here in the u.s because we believe in you yeah thanks thanks dick you have any other words no i think you said it perfectly okay friends what did you think of our conversation I hope I didn't come across as too much of a fangirl. I'll let you in on a secret. When Dick and I debriefed after this conversation, he teased me a bit. But here's what I'll say in my defense. Getting to hear from a rising star who is composed, analytical, and focused truly impacted me. I hope it did for you too. So let us know. Drop me a line via email, sabrina at twoguysagirlandf1.com. As I said at the beginning of our episode, If you haven't already, 
please take a moment to follow us and give us five stars on your favorite podcast app, as well as share this episode with other F1 fans. We know our growth is because of you. And the guys and I thank you. And with that, let me say, we'll keep talking and you can keep listening in because we're just two guys, a girl and F1. For John, Dick and me, Sabrina, thanks for listening.